All right, for this reading, we are going to go through are viruses living or not? So we're going to read this Khan Academy article and we're going to talk about is something living or non-living. So to know if something's living or not, this is going to take our seven criteria and compare it to viruses. So after this reading is done, you are going to go back into your Google Classroom and you are going to explain whether you think viruses are alive or not. Um, it does not matter which position you take as long as you go with facts from this article. So I'm going to use the pen on screen and underline and highlight some facts so that way you know you have the facts ready to go. So the first thing, living things must maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is all about balance. Can something control its internal temperature or its internal contents? In earlier drafts of Criteria for Life, the requirement was that living things must be made of cells. Viruses are not made of cells. A single virus particle, known as a virion, and is made up of a set of genes bundled with protective, protective protein shell called capsid. Certain virus strains will have an extra membrane, the lipid bilayer, surrounding it called an envelope. Viruses do not have a nuclei, organelles, or a cytoplasm like cells do, and so they have no way to monitor or create change in their internal environment. This criterion asks whether an individual virion is capable of maintaining a steady state internal environment on its own. Though some have argued that the capsid and envelope help virions resist change in their environment, the general consensus is viruses do not pass this first requirement for life. Still, very few things in biology are black and white. So let's check out how viruses do the rest of the list before we make our final decision. So, even though the verdict is fail, we can go back and we can kind of argue both points here. Viruses do not have nuclei, organelle, cytoplasm like cells do. No way to create or monitor or change internal environment. Um, I'm going to change my pen to blue so it's a little bit easier to see both sides. So our capsid and envelope resist change in their environment. Let's keep going. Living things have different levels of organization. Life is a complicated idea and live organisms reflect that complexity and their structure. Smaller building blocks come together to make a larger product. Viruses certainly do this. They have genes made from nucleic acids and a capsid made of smaller subunits called capsomeres. All right, so this verdict is pass. So we use blue for our pass color. So we have living things have organization. So we have genes made of nucleotides and a capsid made of capsomeres. Living things reproduce. One of the most basic urges in nature is for a species to pass on its genetic information. Viruses definitely multiply. While our immune systems could certainly handle a single viron, it's the hundreds of thousands of virons created in a short period of time that harm our cells. Viruses must use host cells to create more virons. Since viruses don't have organelles, nuclei, or even ribosomes. They don't have the tools they need to copy their genes, much less create whole new virons. Instead, viruses enter living cells and then hijack the host's cellular equipment to copy the viral genetic information, build new capsids, and assemble everything together. 
We use the term replicate instead of reproduce to indicate viruses need a host cell to multiply. So we're going to look for the pro here. So living viruses, living things. Do living things reproduce? Yes. So viruses enter living cells and then they hijack the cellular equipment. And then our con here, the reason it's not alive, or the reason we don't think it's alive, is that they don't, they can't do it on their own. They don't have nuclei, they don't have ribosomes, they don't have what they need to copy their own genes. Sorry, I'm not good at making straight lines on my computer. It's the mouse. All right, living things grow. You're not the same size as you used to be, right? So they use energy and nutrients to become larger in size or more complex. Viruses manipulate host cells into building new viruses, which means each virus has created its fully formed state, and will neither increase in size nor complexity throughout existences. Viruses do not grow. All right, so that's just a straight fail. So we're going to say viruses do not grow. All right. Next thing, living things use energy. The criterion is somewhat tricky here. Creating a new virion unit is a major undertaking. From building nucleic acids to putting capsids together, that costs a lot of energy. However, all energy that goes into this construction comes from, you guessed it, the host. While viruses will definitely benefit from the use of energy, they are latching onto the host metabolism to get it. Maybe they are vampires. So the viruses don't use energy, they zap your energy. So our con is going to be they latch onto the host's metabolism. And our pro and blue is they do need a lot of energy. <clears throat> Almost done. You guys are doing great. All right. Living things respond to stimuli. So a stimuli or a stimulus is something that causes a change. So when your alarm clock goes off or your cell phone rings, that's a stimulus. When you answer your cell phone, that's your response. Stimulus is something that causes something to happen, like a fire alarm going off. The response is you getting out of the building. So whether viruses respond to their environment is one of the trickiest questions to answer. A response to a stimulus is defined by an almost immediate reaction to some change in the environment. While they don't change behaviors in response to a touch, sound, or light the way humans bacteria, or a sea sponge might, there's not been enough research done to definitely say that viruses do not respond to anything. So we're going to put in, um, we're going to pick a different color. I wonder, let's do this yellow. Maybe. Or whatever color it chooses. There we go, yellow. We're going to say that there is not a lot of evidence. All right. Living things adapt to their environment. Adaptation and evolution happen through unintentional changes called mutations that are advantageous to an entire species. Viruses definitely adapt to their surroundings. Unlike the previous requirement, which required an immediate response, adaptation is a process that best takes place over time. A virus can live in two different phases. The lytic phase, where the virus actively replicates in the host cell, and the lysogenic phase, where the viral DNA incorporates itself in the cell's DNA and multiplies whenever the cell multiplies. 
Sometimes a host does not have enough energy or supplies to support the virus to actively replicate, so it will switch to the lysogenic phase. The virus can eventually re-enter the lytic phase when the conditions are right. The ability to adapt is what makes a human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, as hard to treat as it is. HIV mutates quickly because it makes frequent mistakes while replicating its genome. Genome is just another word to say, like, all of its genes. Because the virus is constantly changing, it makes it very hard to design drugs and vaccine against it. One drug might prevent a large number of virons from replicating, but just a few unaffected. Those surviving virons will continue to infect more cells, making copies of the resistant strains. All right, so for living things, we can say that viruses definitely adapt to their surroundings. Right. So even scientists don't know what to do with this. So where does that leave us? Are viruses alive? Are they dead? We know they're not dead because death is what happens when a living organism stops performing biological functions. But for the moment, we're only interested in the active particles. So were they ever alive? Most biologists say no. Viruses are not made out of cells. They can't keep themselves in a stable state. They don't grow and they don't make their own energy. Even though they definitely replicate and adapt to the environment, viruses are most likely an android, more like androids than living organisms. Just like some crazy robot viruses are created fully formed, rely on the host material and to power themselves. So things we have to think about is like, how are we going to get rid of viruses? If a virus isn't alive, how are we going to deal with viral infections? We can't use antibiotics because those treat bacterial infections. And they're useless against dealing with viral infections like the flu or chickenpox. So we have to target them in different ways. Instead of destroying the virus, antiviral medicines try to shut off the replication cycle, like shutting down an android production line. What happens if a virus infects another virus? Scientists found a bacteria-sized giant virus, which they named mama virus upon further study. It turned out this giant virus actually had a smaller virus associated with it. When my mama virus infected an amoeba, which is a little one-cell organism, it created a giant virus factory whose machinery was hijacked by this smaller virus. Some scientists had pointed out that if the virus can get sick, then it should be considered living. This was just a quick little intro about um, is or are viruses considered living or not. What you're going to do now is you're going to take this information and you are going to create a short paragraph on a Google Doc and argue are viruses alive or not. You need to include three things with that. So we went through all seven. You pick three and tell me, in your opinion, based on these facts, are viruses living or non-living?